Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah actually, it's fun again. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, this is our second exhibition of um, TV design. We had one two years ago, and it was a very successful exhibition, so obviously we're going to do it again regardless. Um, so we got, it's a, basically a group exhibition of uh, all their work, and so we also have the privilege of ha having Romolo to attend the, the opening, and also uh, Steve Anderson, he, he's the manager of TV Design. And, um, um, and of course, most importantly, we have um, Jennifer Isaacs, who's um, uh, a consultant and an expert on Aboriginal art, and particularly TV and Yurikala. Um, I had the privilege of joining um, Jenny when she went to TV in 2008 um, while she was writing her book, you know, a definitive book on TV art and culture. And so I was um, very fortunate to be able to tag along and, uh, <laughs> and learn a lot of things about TV. And so I remember saying to her at the time that, like, actually before we went on that trip, you know, like, because we talked about already, I said, I'm starting a gallery, this is 2007, um, and I said, you know, like, you know, she, she mentioned about writing a book, so I thought, okay, all right, I will um, have that as the, the inaugural exhibition for our opening, but obviously it took a while to get books published and so on, so, uh, and it was eventually published about three years ago. Um, we also have a have copies of that book if anyone is interested to purchase it. It's uh, $120 each. There's also a limited edition one, uh, which includes sort of a limited edition you know, etching and, and drawing and so on. So if anyone's interested, come and see me and uh, we'll organize that. Um, you can even get Jenny to sign it while you're here. Um, <laughs> okay. The artist not me. Okay, okay. So uh, because I'm introducing you, so I have to speak about you first. <laughs> So um, I'd like you all to welcome um, Jennifer Isaacs. Thanks, Simon. Um, well, this is the second time I've opened an exhibition TV art here, both of them from the Tiwi Design Centre. There are three in the Tiwi Islands, three big art centres. Tiwi Design, the one you're in now, is the first the historic centre with very great artists still practising. Um, what I'd say for those of you who have no background, there's probably a few of you, <laughs> if not many though, maybe. Um, when you look at Tiwi art, you have to take off all your blinkers about something being Aboriginal, in inverted commas. This is the art of a distinct ethnic group, an Indigenous Australian group, but they have no real lineage or long-term biological ties to Aboriginal people of Australian mainland. They are themselves. Their language reflects that. Their worldview still reflects that, even though there's enormous amount of interconnection with Australia, with the mainland, and there's a large Tiwi population now in Darwin as well. But I found in my, well, it's, it's embarrassing to say how many years I've been going to the Tiwi Islands. <laughs> I think I was about 23 when I first went there, so you'll have to guess. <laughs> Ten years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but the first person I met to help in their art career was B. Tungatalam, who founded this centre, and he was only 18 at the time. And he's now the elder of the whole community and the mainstay, and Steve has been telling me he's now going to with renewed confidence, he came down for the big exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art only about six weeks or two months ago. And so that's going to be a revival of traditional TV skills. They're an island people um, involved with the sea and with the legends of the sea and with the island um, vegetation and beaches and so on. Their mythology is completely different to the mainland and it's reflected totally in the art on these walls. How can I get you to look at this with new eyes and not just see patterns or fabrics or <laughs> decorative things? I think if you think of, I don't know, something Japanese perhaps, Zen, uh, if you change your, your, your mindset to wanting something that speaks to you in, a, um, in language that you understand and simply look at them as being meditations or reflections 
by the individual artists about their own Tiwi life, family, in particular family, history, genealogy of that family, which goes right back to the land. They were originally about 10 or 13 different clan mm. groups who own different sections of the island. So there's actually a map in my book dividing it up so you can see all the different land holding group groups. That still permeates conversations, behaviour. That's that mob over there. That's not part of us, but all of you are my brothers or my cousins and that sort of thing. Right. So in discussions of even food come down, that would be going on in the Tiwi side as to how to do that correctly. And when it comes to art, very much um, the practice itself of making contemporary art as opposed to ceremonial art does get handed through family as being almost like the old artisan techniques in Asia. If your father or grandfather was a maker of things for sale, that might be where you look for your heritage, which Romulo is exactly a leading example of that his grandfather having been one of the main famous artists of the 60s, correct? And also who went and danced for Queen Elizabeth on her first visit to Australia. So the Tiwi in another, wearing another hat are the way Australia has always flagged itself to the world. Aboriginal men with feathers, body paint in spectacular array. So that's the next point. These pa paintings are often reflecting that body art which itself also is reflected on the, what are called tutini, the big burial poles that are unique to Tiwi culture for funerals, erected around the grave to, to represent kin and family watching over that spirit, while everybody dances their dances around. And every individual person has a particular dance that's theirs, and that's known in the community. It's maybe a shark, it may be a crocodile, and that relates to totemic belief and knowledge of the land that they come from. We might get lucky later if we enthuse with Romolo if his knee gets <laughs> <laughs> yeah. better. Um, in terms of contemporary art, the Tiwi design have resolutely withstood the entire push of the contemporary art world that happened in the 90s where they got huge canvases and everybody was bidding in selfies to 50,000, 100,000, you name it. Tiwi kept doing their thing. You know, you couldn't change them. Some art advisors tried and there was a little spate of very big canvases, but really you have to respect what the artists themselves want to do, wanted to do. And sometimes I had to look at those paintings and think, well, you know, that might have saved the art centre at that point because it did get a big price. But nevertheless, you watch the artists themselves and they reflect back basically to the size that they're used to, the body, the tutini, and so on. Um, it's still an economic pursuit and it's one of the main, almost the only money generating practice in the Tiwi Islands would be art. Would that still be right? So we're here as a special group and I would urge you to also put, put on your philanthropic hat <laughs> today because it's very important every two years if Tiwi have a show in Sydney that we at least try to sell at least 50% or something like that because the cost to the community to get down here and show us themselves through their art is huge. So thank you to Simon. I want to thank Simon for being a really loyal networker. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's always being written up as being the, the Sydney networker par, par excellence. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he is. <laughs> but he's also very loyal. And so I'm loyal back to him. And I think that is to give another cultural slant on it. One of the joys that he's brought me to get to know all of his Chinese community, Australian Chinese community friends, because I feel like I've got yet another family. Many different Aboriginal <laughs> families. <laughs> As I was visiting my father in, um, he's in an aged care home, and the phone rang, and it was um, a Tiwi uh, lady who was very involved with me in, in my 20s, and she was in financial distress. So Dad heard me say, what's the BSB? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he said, how many more of these have you got? <laughs> well, I certainly couldn't tell him. <laughs> 
but I'm delighted to because it's been really um, a big part of my life. Ninety percent, probably ten percent here. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Fifty percent, fifty percent might have been. So please enjoy the paintings. I'm not going to go through each one because you've got two people here right beside you, and I would urge anyone interested to actually nail them. And maybe we don't talk so long, but a few of you walk around with each of us, and we tell you about the paintings that you might have caught your eye because I'm here to help in that regard too. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I'll get um, Steve Anderson, the manager, to say a few words. Thank you, Simon. Um, yes, I also would like to acknowledge the uh, tr traditional owners um, whose land we are gathered here today, both the past, uh, present and future. Um, yes, it was been, has been a couple of years since we've been here, and I, I remember last time we came here was under quite sorry circumstances, so it's very nice to be here. Um, even though always there's sorry business going on, um, we're, it's not so close to home in that way. Um, yes, to talk about Tiwi iconography is something that I, having been at the Art Centre for seven years now, I, I have a, a fair bit of uh, knowledge there, but I usually try to def defer to the artists myself because they're the direct lineage, and so of course I do know some of the stories. But if you just take a picture, this, this picture here, I'm seeing it in a new light because I used to see where it was hanging back in the gallery, and um, it was up high, and it looked much bigger than it actually does here mm -hmm. because it's quite a large painting for Roslyn. Um, these are called tumors. And they have a, quite a few different functions um, in Tiwi cultural life. Okay. One marking the end of the Pukamani ceremony, which they decorate the grave sites. Also, they um, they have got a practical uh, usage to carry bush tucker, the, a folded piece of bark. Um, so this is Rosalind putting these into her work, and yet look at the design work around. She's playing, she's having fun, but she's actually revisiting her her past in the now. I just, Roslyn's work is just so vibrant. I, I, here's another one of her pieces of the four skin groups, um, rock, pandanus, sun and fish. She has a, 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 and back in the gallery, she has a large version of this painting. Um, so it's, it's subtly different, but you can see that it's directly related as another family member to, to the way she approaches even her art practice is a very, familial approach. Um, the mixing of colours also is something that's been, um, she's, she, she's engaged in here, the mixing of blacks to get grey, black and whites to get greys, the subtle greens. This is all with only three, two colours actually, white and yellow, because we cook the, we cook the yellow to make red. And so variations of that mix. So with a very small palette, a, a really broad range of different tones and colours can be achieved. So it's always in being inventive. The creative, the creativity is something that actually comes out of a relationship with the paintings is what I've been seeing. And every time they're not formulaic, every time they seem to be somehow different. And I find it, in my role, that's one of the greatest privileges I have is I get to see these things being made. A lot of people say to me, you must have a fantastic collection, Steve, of over the years, the things you've been doing. I actually, no, not really. It's actually being part of the process and being involved in, in that is really the, the greatest gift that I've actually received as, far, as part of the job, um, to be honest. And I'm really thankful to Simon also. He's got a very astute eye. He picked the show and 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 he was really quite clear about how he could see it based on what we'd put up here a couple of years before. And um, I think it's a very good mix of what's going on at the Arts Centre at the moment from senior artists to emerging artists. Um, when I say emerging artists, it's probably some of our emerging artists have been painting for 20 years. So seniority probably comes from success and the lineage of the, 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 the heritage of who your parents were and what line you come down and uh, what collections you're in and how much money you can get for your paintings based on what's been collected. Um, 
So there's a lot of competing factors in, in actually what makes a senior artist and what's an emerging artist. We have these two camps, but I don't really think we have any emerging artists as in, in the context of what we would might consider an emerging artist, meaning someone just starting out. Um, Rosalind's considered an emerging artist, but she's been painting for a long time, and so she's quite adept, and yet she's really free. Um, similarly, Maria Josette's use of the cone. I mean, it, she uses a wooden cone probably <coughs> shaped like your fingers that made of ironwood that she dabs. And these are behind you here. They're circles with a... I mean, like, they're hard, it's hard to do it. It defies me how she actually does it with such dexterity. It's because she's used that cone so long and made so many marks. And you can see right next to her, her this is a mother and daughter relationship. This is the great Jean Baptista Cortini, um, who's been hasn't been with us for perhaps three years now, maybe a little bit longer. Josette lost her husband only a few weeks ago. Um, so there's other backstories to these paintings and relationships that I'm privy to, but you're looking at that and you're going, well, that's different to that, but this is a mother and daughter. When her, when her mum passed away, she was expected to actually receive a lot of those stories and paint those stories, but Josette had been already making her own way, so that road was already... a different path was made for her, but because she'd been, uh, you know, creating her own identifiable marks. So, they're standalone and yet they do relate. Um, so I think uh, some of the relationships, also the smaller paintings in the inside there, so I'm lo lovely, all those same sizes, look fantastic. I won't talk about the upside down fish. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> there was 10 o'clock at night when I was hanging. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd like to pay attention to this painting here. This is um, one of Josette's most recent works. Um, interestingly, it's a freeing up of her mark making. Normally, if you look at some of the other paintings, they're very grid-like, very linear. Whereas these, this seems to be actually opening up off the grid. And this comes at a period of time when she's just lost her husband. So actually, she's at a time of deep grief, she's actually freeing herself up with through her artwork. I mean, I know my own response to it in, 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 in times of grief and tragedy is to actually perhaps do the opposite, to retreat inside and get small and tighter when she's actually moved out and embrace, in, embrace the process, the grief process, and actually putting it there in a graphic representation. It's, um, for me personally, I think that's a, it's not a new direction, but it's a new approach, a new sensitivity that that she's, she's bringing to the work. If you can look at the one next to it on the right, you can see it looks like a completely different artist. Mm -hmm. That's Josette, no, that's, uh, no, that's um, that is um, Rosalind. This is of the same vein, the same, the same date, the same time she's been making the same one. So she's mixing the, she's mixing the, ochres with subtle blends of white but for example that is this red ochre pure mixed with a touch of the white ochre mm. to get these colours and she's doing this at now in the studio with 